Hello, and welcome to the Saints and Sinners Pride Fest video series. I'm Susan Larson, the host of The Reading Life on WWNOFM, New Orleans NPR affiliate. I have the pleasure and privilege today of talking with James Hanahan, author, artist, performer, teacher. You may know his multi genre book, Pilot Imposter, his novel, God Says No, a Stonewall Book Award finalist or Delicious Foods, winner of the Penn Faulkner Award and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. His most recent book is the critically acclaimed, Did Nobody Give a Shit What Happened to Carlotta? For some reason, people love saying that title. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I love hearing it, actually. I bet you do. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Now, so many of your books are issue oriented. God says no, takes on conversion therapy, delicious foods, that stunning book deals with human trafficking and really modern day slavery. And don't didn't nobody give a shit what happened to Carlotta. It's about a trans woman who is coming out of prison and trying to make a new life after decades of incarceration. So what comes first for you, the individual characters, the issues? What is the inspiration? Well, I mean, it's funny you should you should ask about things coming first because I I always feel like it all sort of happens at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> actually, the the metaphor I was going to use was about the way the pandemic started, which was that it didn't really like it was hard to control because it started without anybody knowing it was starting. It, you know, it was popping up in various places and not going anywhere, right? Like no one was getting it. And then, you know, after a, after a, a longer period of time, it caught on in certain places. Um, and that, I feel like that's more like what the process is like. Well, that makes it's sense. It's like, or it's like maybe for a, for a, a less sort of uh, fraught and upsetting metaphor, um, when I was in uh, when I was in college and I was learning to draw, one of the rules that they tried to emphasize was that if you were drawing for, from life, you shouldn't like start in one corner and then move, you know, to the rest of the page. Mm -hmm. The thing they would say is start everywhere. So like get a sense of the relationships, you know, on the page so that you can, you know, so that you're not going to be like, drawing something distorted by the end of the process. Um, and I think that's more what happens when I'm working. Um, I guess I have, I have one idea and then another idea comes out of that idea. And gradually I back myself into a corner mm -hmm. um, and the, the book figures out what it wants to be. <laughs> Almost like, Without my input, it feels like sometimes. Um, but I guess you know these interests are are part of what keeps me uh, working, and and especially when it has to do with you know an individual who is sort of out of um, out of sync with their society in a pretty radical kind of way, like somebody who you know, like Gary Gray is trying really hard to be normal mm -hmm. um, and in some in some ways kind of succeeds um but then uh but is like sort of hopelessly an outsider despite his his best efforts and then Darlene and Eddie who are you know um in delicious foods who are I mean I guess they're also sort of they they have a certain kind of uh they've they've risen to a certain level in society but then they get like taken down completely by this you know rapacious version of capitalism um that involves human trafficking um and you know and then of course like you know the the anti activist activism of the area they're living in but that's you know, that's what gets rid of their uh, patriarch, I guess. Um, and I mean, it's even more obvious, I think, in Carlotta, right? That yeah. you know, Carlotta is somebody who 
is just trying to live her life the way you know is it's true to her and and yet every every system every including you know the family and the criminal justice system and everything else around her is saying like no you have to you have to play by our rules um no you you know you're not allowed to do x y and z thing that is you know critical to your living as a with integrity right. um, so i think that's really the the thing that is most sort of compelling to me about any one of these narratives is just that like to find some character who's like you know just trying to be who they are and yeah. being completely sort of you know beaten beaten down by various systems and the world just conspires against them one of the things that fascinated me so much was that Carlotta is like a perfect book for where we are now emerging from the pandemic because everything has changed we're all emerging and and we don't you know we're still feeling our way along and it's so um you feel her quest so much more in a heartfelt way, you know, because we've all been undergoing that quest. And so I wonder if you'd read that section I mentioned to you, because it's so much of that is about the changes in what was once her daily life. Um, okay. So it's from Carlotta entertained herself. Is that what you guys are? Yes. <clears throat> Carlotta entertained herself by pretending to look out the window while staring at other pa passengers' reflections, checking for anyone else who might be looking out the window. None of them were, including someone who wanted to get out at the next stop. Without raising his head from his phone, he pressed a button on a metal column that made a chime go off and lit a red sign at the front of the bus that said, Stop Requested. It's like... I've been away so long that motherfuckers don't learn a different language for me. And every time they get a second to day self, they start messing around with that phone. Motherfuckers used to talk to motherfuckers. Now everybody be a zombie trapped in their own little world, watching some apples blow up on a little portable TV. I guess it keeps some stone freaks from getting up in your grill or playing a ghetto blasters all crunk. But don't nobody think it'd been nice in the way back to say like, hello to Mrs. Jones or Mr. Davis when they's on their way to work. I mean, I hated Mrs. Jones and Mr. Davis and the damn skank ass children too, but it just seemed crazy. There's just all these folks out here with all this freedom to do any goddamn shit they want. Like look out there, a whole bunch of construction going on. They'll go a cute little park with a whole bunch of benches. There's birds flying, kids playing, trees everywhere. Why y'all don't stop and appreciate no trees? If y'all been where I've been for them 7,974 days, ain't seen a single damn tree except one little stink weed in solitary, you'd be out there trying to hump them motherfucking trees. Maybe that's what freedom is, the freedom to waste your motherfucking freedom, to not even notice you got it till you wind up behind bars getting your ass beat and raped by a rapist who crying rape. Hell, I wonder how free anybody who out here pissing away their freedom freedom anyhow gotta work 10 jobs and still can't afford no rent getting kicked around by the man getting kicked around by your own damn man your family up in your face trying to tell you how to live your life all the time be a woman be a man wear this don't wear that watch the same fucking tv shows i watch even though i know they suck Listen to the same bullshit everybody else listening to. Else they kick you out your broom closet. P.O.'s trying to make your whole life illegal. Putting all kind of stips up in your business. Can't go in no bars. Can't be around nobody drinking. Can't look at a Miller Lite ad on the motherless TV. Shit, I'm going to have to be that person myself. And I ain't exactly down for that. But anything above ground beats the shoe. Beats the shoe. Amen. I love her voice. I love you channeling her voice too. <laughs> I mean, so we get these two worlds of hers, the world she's emerged into that has changed so much from her original Brooklyn, Fort Greene, right? Mm -hmm. And then prison. And there are so many incredibly vivid portrayals of life inside prison, like that description of solitary 
as a hell of a hell is what it is. You know, and I it made me think of Albert Woodfox's book, Solitary, mm -hmm. and what it was like to spend uh, yeah. all the time alone right, and right. what saved him. So mm -hmm. what was it like for you to move back and forth between those two worlds? Um, do you mean in Carlotta's mind? Because, I mean, I feel like that mm -hmm. was really the, the only way. I mean, this is a book that's not exactly about the experience of being in prison as much as it is about the experience of coming back from prison and how strange this world is in comparison to how strange that world is. So <clears throat> in a way, I was actually trying to look more carefully at like, what is it that's strange about our world mm -hmm. um, as opposed to trying to look at prison and say like this is a really crazy thing because that that's I think where Carlotta's head is right she's like she she's been in this odd situation for such a long time that it feels like it's normal and mm -hmm. returning to the so-called free world um is a is a mind trip it's like you know she she notices at a certain point that um the word for re the word for coming back to uh, coming back from uh, prison and coming back from outer space, they use the same term, re-entry, right? <laughs> so there was something like in that you know dual me meaning of that word that I thought was kind of um, telling about the whole situation, right? It's like this: you come back to this place where you thought you think you knew it. Yeah. But what you knew was something so long ago that it's not, it, it doesn't make any sense anymore. Well, you uh, were talking once about how you like to pile up the challenges when you sit down to write and make your life more difficult than ever, you know? Well, and it's not my life that I'm making more difficult. The project. <laughs> the work. <laughs> the work. The work. Um, and you talked about choosing to write about Carlotta as a trans woman. So talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that choice. Well, I mean, what happened was I started out with just the very vague feeling of wanting to write about my neighborhood, yeah. um, which has not always been my neighborhood, but it was my father's neighborhood, actually. Um, uh, my family bought a house there in the 50s um, that two of my cousins still live in. Um, and... I watched over the course of my lifetime this neighborhood Fort Greene go from like being a, a supposedly dangerous uh, black neighborhood. Although to me, it was just where my grandmother lived, right? So I was not really cognizant so much of like how dangerous it was um, because it was also this kind of sanctuary at the same time. Um, and uh, but I've watched it go from what's a supposedly dangerous black neighborhood to not just um, a much whiter, not completely, but much whiter neighborhood. Um, and, you know, all of the streets and the businesses and the buildings changing to also being a kind of literary capital of the country. Right. <laughs> I know. Um, that's, it just seemed so strange to me um, that I wanted to write about that, but I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to write a nonfiction book. But I needed somebody for whom I needed to write a, a character for whom it would be surprising, right? Yeah. Uh, and I and I thought, well, my next step was like, well, maybe it's somebody who's been away for a long time, and maybe you know, since I already have this like, you know, affinity for social issues creeping into the work, like, of course, I was like, oh, maybe they were in prison. And then I started to try to insert my own self into, you know, what this situation would be like. And I started do some, doing some research. Like, you know, I was like, I, as an openly gay man, I really don't think it would be such a great idea to, you know, I don't think I would have it so good. But then I started reading the stories of like trans people who had been, you know, either either come out while they were in a, in the wrong facility or... Um, had been placed in the wrong facility. And that to me felt like even more sort of um, outrageous and upsetting and, you know, got back to, to, for me, it got back, to, you know, to the heart of that thing that, that like, 
you know, makes me want to write a book, um, you know, finding some individual who's just like being sort of, um, uh, well, oppressed is really the word by the, by various systems, not, you know, not just one system, but like a variety of them. Um, <clears throat> and then I thought, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that. And then this voice came to me. That's what I want to hear about. I the first time you heard her voice, I can't imagine. Well, it, it's I I can't say that it was the first time I'd ever heard this voice because like I don't know years ago I wrote a a story, um in a voice that was not dissimilar, mm -hmm. um, and I spent a lot of time in the clubs in the nineties like watching drag performers and trans and drag queens. There there was like a lot less sort of um, balkanization of the ideas of transness and um, queerness and um, at least in the East Village at the time, it was just like everybody was on stage doing whatever they were gonna do. And some of them were, you know, pre-op trans, some of them were trans, some of them were post-op. It just like, it was like, it didn't really make that much of a difference um, on, the, on the stage. Um, especially if you were a sort of funny, engaging performer. Um, and I mean, there were, I, and I, I, I mean, I, I was immersed in that world for a while. And so, and I have a good ear for language and for the way people um, talk about things. And, you know, I've, comedy is kind of one of the things that I um, start out, started out wanting to do and started out wanting to be good at or or just being funny anyway and, and so <laughs> all of this, and the, so it's it's sort of like this voice was like an amalgamation in a lot of ways of like all of these things I was already interested in um and and I felt like I could probably pull it off and it was fun it was actually really fun to kind of hear her voice in my ear and just be like you know just run with it but you can't get her out of your head when you're through. You just can't. She's in there all the time. I mean, I've I've seen, I've heard people, performers who do this kind of who who do that kind of voice mm -hmm. and are that kind of person. And I've read things that were written in that way. And I was like, why is this not in a book somewhere? You no, know, it seems like, I mean, especially with like queer jargon and queer. This is the way queer people have talked for ages. Just doesn't, there's no, there isn't enough sort of commemoration of that in literature. There isn't enough sort of, I, I feel like a book can be a way of capturing the way that people use language at a particular time mm -hmm. in, in the world. And there's something about the way that I think this sort of MFA industrial complex tries to you know keep you from using jargon and profanity and um slang and all of those things that the way that they actually work in our society is completely different than the way they end up in literature i mean it's almost as if um like if you know how to talk the talk of a particular community you can infiltrate it like no question like if you know how to, you know, if you know how to say, like, let's say, you, you know, you're like, a, we want to pretend to be a construction worker. <laughs> like all you'd have to do is to like know all of the things that construction workers might say. Right. And just have like, but that's sort of what, that's sort of what authors do too, right? It's like we try to figure out how to authentically represent a community through language. Um, and sometimes language alone and not necessarily, you know, firsthand experience with whatever community we're talking about, um, which, you know, it's a, it's a kind of sleight of hand, but it's, um, it's kind of, there's no, there's sort of no other trick in the book in a weird way. There's like, you've, there's like, if you, if you take away the, the ability of an author to, to imagine somebody else's life, somebody who's different than them, like you, you don't have anything left. What you have is like a memoir and that's a totally different art form. I was struck by how many reviewers mentioned the profanity, made a point of mentioning it, you know? And to me, it was like, 
profanity is high art in this book. I mean, it's perfection, you know. Well, you came with it in different shades. Thank you very so. much for saying that. Because, I mean, it was one of those things that I knew it was a risk because I know people, you know, flip out about that, especially people who are like kind of stuffed shirts in the literary world. And I was like, there's no other way to represent this voice and this community that, you know, authentically without profanity. Like there's just no way. And so, you know, I figured why not just, if I'm gonna do it, I might as well turn it all the way up. So um, the audio book, now I have to ask. Oh, well, I did it along with a comedian named Flame Monroe, ah. um, who is trans. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was looking around, it was important to me to try to find somebody who is trans to do the audiobook because I wanted on a certain level to emphasize that Carlotta was not just a, a character that I had written. Carlotta was not supposed to be me. Um, Carlotta um, was a role, in fact, you know, it's not something that I was like, hey, I want this to be a movie and that's why I'm writing this. But I did, I, I was always conscious of the fact that like a trans actor could play this part. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, and I wanted to make that, I wanted to get work for a trans actor basically. And not <laughs> just like, I could have done it myself, but I was like, it would be more fun. Um, yeah. And I was looking, I was looking for someone to do it. And I ran across Flame's stand-up routine on YouTube. And I was like, my jaw dropped because like Flame is more like Carlotta than I even knew when I saw this. It was like, it was like Carlotta dropped out of the sky, really. Wow, what a feeling. It wasn't until we started recording that I realized that Flame had a lot more in common with Carlotta than I realized. Um, and he, she, we, as he, she, we likes to call <laughs> he, she, we, so. <laughs> wow, um, it really brought something, some other, some things, some sensitivity to the to the role that I was not really um, aware would happen. I really was. We re worked really hard on the audiobook, and I'm very um, happy that it it worked out the way that it did. Oh, that would be fun! It was made to be an audiobook, truly. Now well, you said that you were inspired by Ulysses, which I can see when I go back. Yeah. To so talk a little bit about, you know, that's such a massive presence in every reader's life who's made their way through it. You mm -hmm. know, I remember the first time I read it and I read this, there was the book, there was a reference guide, there was a dictionary there, you know, it was like the ultimate labor of reading love. You know what I mean? To get through that book. Yeah. So, how did that work for you? Well, it's funny that you said this book was meant to be an audiobook because I feel the same way about Ulysses. I feel like Ulysses is so much easier to get through if you're listening to it. And of course, you know, Joyce was a musician, a singer, and he was very attentive to like the sound of language and the, you know, sounds around him. And, and, um, and so, I, I, by the time I was done with the book, um, I thought, oh, this is just, this is an audiobook that before audiobooks were a thing. Um, but the, the way, you know, the, the snowball effect of, of writing this book was um, a little bit later in the process after I had already started like putting words on the page. Um, I noticed that by uh, by telling the story of somebody who's coming back from upstate New York, uh, I was by necessity um, retelling the Odyssey because um, there are a lot of municipalities in upstate New York that were named by this one guy after the Revolutionary War who was a, a classical literature buff. Um, so, you know, there's like Ithaca and... Troy and there's a Homer and a Ovid, Romulus. There's like all these places that are are named for classical things. And I thought, well, I should acknowledge that in some way in this in the story. But then I thought, you know, everybody and their brother has done, you know, Ulysses as a excuse me, the Odyssey as like a thing. 
that they are playing on in their work. And I thought, oh, it's sort of tired, isn't it? Um, but that happened to be around the same time that my husband, who is of Irish descent, and I um, went to Ireland. And I, I hadn't ever been there. He had been there, his uh, grandparents on his father's side and his great-grandparents on his mother's side were Irish. And um, they used to have a house there and he would visit every summer for a stretch, but hadn't been there in a long time. And so I, whenever we go to a new place, I usually bring a representative work of literature with me and I chose to bring Ulysses. And then, of course, everybody in Ireland was like, don't read that. What are you reading that rubbish for? You know, <laughs> so. Um, and, it, you know, it wasn't really, it's not really a beach read. No. I guess there is the Sandy Mount chapter. <laughs> but, you know, today is Bloomsday. Oh, that's right. Happy Bloomsday, my goodness. Today too. This thing, somewhere people are reading Ulysses out loud. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a, a variety of places, in fact. But it's also, Carlotta is also, like Ulysses, a great novel of place mm. and love of place. Well, once I had decided that I was going to use it, I had to read it. Um, really read it. And what I ended up doing was uh, I brought it with me to a residency. And I also brought um, a series of CDs um from the great courses i don't know if you know this series but they're like you know lectures like um lectures by well-known or prominent professors um and i i watched uh what what i would do is i would let my eyes pass over an episode of ulysses um because it didn't really always feel like reading yeah it's just sort of like okay i've I saw that, <laughs> and then I would, and then I would watch the corresponding lecture by this guy James Heffernan, who is a Dartmouth professor. Uh, I think he's a professor. He's a professor emeritus at this point, but like, um, who is he's sort of lively and funny, and he's kind of like the Stephen Colbert of of uh, English literature scholarship, um, and that was often more in, i've had more insight to into what i had read um than actually reading the text sometimes um and then i did listen to some of it there's a um there's an irish national theater uh dramatization of ulysses on youtube somewhere that if you put it all together it's the whole thing um and that was really kind of great too i was initially going to like try to read along at the same time as they're you know along with the book but eventually i was just like well put this book aside <laughs> let's just listen to this um so i mean that's that's sort of how it wound it's wound up but then you know the i think there was enough there was something about the book that structurally i thought i could use Mm -hmm. um because it you know supposedly takes place just in the course of this one day right um i didn't want to i didn't want to copy that exactly i just wanted to sort of i mean that's i think that's the general rule for me when it comes to like you know inspiration or taking taking something from somewhere i can't just take it wholesale i just i have to do something to alter it in some way. So like the majority of Carlotta is on one day, but it's not, it's bookended by the first and the last chapter. Yeah. But, you know, but that was, it was definitely a structural grab. And then there are a lot of like little minor jokes about Ulysses and, and the Odyssey that inspire probably every scene in the book. Yeah. There are a lot. You could go digging for them, but you don't have to. That's the thing. I really am not fond of books that make you feel as if you should have read other books before you read them. Guilt-inducing books. Oh my god! I just I never want to read a, a book like that because I'm like I'm not going to understand any of this. I'd I'd rather read the you know the first one. <laughs> uh, but but this book is actually designed to do the opposite. 
Mm -hmm. It's like, I'd rather people read this first and then, and then the other, you know, canonical works if they haven't already read them. And then for people who have read them, you know, you're sort of in on it a little bit and you can like giggle at the fact that, you know, the, um, the, the soul singer with the eye patch is named Polly Famous. <laughs> I did giggle a lot, but I, <laughs> but I was also moved to tears a lot. I mean, her plights are so dramatic and heartbreaking when they hit you. Yeah, but also all too common when it comes to real people. I mean, I think what happens to her is fairly mild compared to what happens to actual people in these sorts of situations. Right. It's nightmarish. That's not even nightmare-ish. It's like a nightmare. Living nightmare. Well, mm. one thing I wanted to ask you, you have you have this formidable array of talents. You know, you're a performing artist, you're a visual artist, you're a writer, you bring all these things to the table. And I want you to talk for me a little bit, if you would, about your feelings for the book as a physical object. I mean, I think of how beautiful your books are. I love the cover of, of this book, the most recent one. And your cousin, Kara Walker, did the cover for Delicious Foods. Mm -hmm. And you have done artist books yourself and competed successfully with that. So I wonder if you talk a little bit about how important it is to you the way your books look and feel. Well, I mean, that's a very stealthy little thing. I don't, I don't really think so much about, um, about, I think I've just been really lucky is the thing. Um, no, seriously. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and it's also, I mean, I started out as a graphic designer. My undergraduate degree is in graphic design. Yeah. So it's something I've always been like, aware aware of and thinking about even as I work like one of my favorite ways to like procrastinate is to like you know I don't do it so much anymore but I used to like you know like to print things out and like design covers and you know change the font every once in a while um and uh and and I think you know ultimately it is really great to have like an object that is a little bit of a fetish object yeah. um, that that you have produced. Um, so um, the first time I got lucky because I was with McSweeney's and there's a guy who was an editor and the graphic designer in one person named Eli Horowitz. Um, and it was in a very collaborative sort of process um, which I maybe shouldn't have expected too much um, from Little Brown, which is, you know, a, one of those, it's part of Hachette, one of the big, how many is it? Two, three, the big three, big one, <laughs> the big one, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, but, but I had an offer that they couldn't refuse because Kara had actually asked me um, at a certain point if I needed a cover for God Says No, and I was already writing delicious foods at the time. And I said, no, you want to hold on. <laughs> <laughs> smart. That's smart. Well, I'd already sort of decided I was going to dedicate the book to her. Uh -huh. So, um, and to my friend Clorinda. Um, because, you know, some of what, some of the inspiration for that book was like a conversation, you know, that I would want to have with her, right? Like, you know, I had her, a lot of her work is about a kind of slavery of the imagination and, you know, in comparison to the slavery of um, of the real world in, you know, antebellum slavery in the, in the uh, South, in the American South. Um, and I had come across this story about a woman who was enslaved a black woman who was enslaved in florida in 1992 and that really messed with my mind and i thought oh right, right wow it doesn't have to be a period piece if i want to deal with the legacy of slavery because the legacy of slavery is actually slavery right. 
And that's really something that I don't think anybody wanted to deal with. <laughs> I'm not sure people st still want to deal with that idea. Um, but I, but, you know, to me, it was like, oh, right, of course, you know, um, this is capitalism is, is after cheap labor. And there's always going to be people who put their profit above um, human lives. And there are always going to be like human lives that can be manipulated into, you know, providing that cheap labor because, you know, work, people's people's identities are often really tied to you know what they do for a living mm -hmm. and sometimes they will do for a living well actually sometimes they will do things do sometimes they will do jobs without the the making a living part um or with very minimal amounts of making a living parts um because there's something else that goes along. There's something non-monetary that you get out of having a job, um, even if it's not paying you. It's very weird. But the handyman with no hands, I mean, I'll be carrying that around for the rest of my life, thinking about it. It's just, it was such an amazing thing to read. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of a black chestnut, isn't it? Like the uh, the, the i mean it's it's i won't say it's a joke exactly but it is a sort of like ironic sure. um, encapsulation for me of like the black experience right like you have no hands but you figure out a way to become a handyman somebody who literally needs to work with their hands like you manage to make something out of absolutely nothing like everything has been taken away from you and yet you persevere um you i mean lately i've had this you know i i i will sometimes remind people like some students of mine i remember reminding of this that you know as black americans we are the, the descendants of the people who made it right we're not at the bottom of the ocean um and it's a powerful thing to remember, firstly, because it means like we have persevered, right? But also I started to realize a little later, it's like, we know how to put up with a lot <laughs> for a long ass time. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe not as good a thing, but it's it's important to remember that that, that is part of what the experience is about. So how are you feeling at this moment in you know, this Pride Month, this moment in history, everything seems so fraught these days, you know? Um, <laughs> that's, I'm not sure how to answer that question. That's a really big... I um, write, is that your hopeful act? Is what? Is writing your hopeful act? I mean, is it hopeful? I'm not sure that it's hopeful I exactly. I think, I, I think I'm just more... Uh, I think I want people to kind of look at what they're doing and be sort of, you know, critical of, of what it is we as a society are doing and who we're like crushing underfoot without noticing it. Um, that seems to be much more my, my impetus than like, I don't, I mean, there has to be some kind of, I mean, hope has to kind of get you through your life. Um, yeah. But then again, you know, it's it's not as if there's only so much you can hope for in a life um which is not to you know which is not to be all you know doom and gloom about it but you know i think the life itself has to be on some level the point you can't you know you can only do so much and it seems to me that this is what i can do and so I've been trying to do it. Well, it's so changed. It's it's so made me look at the world differently. It's made me pay attention, which is what you want your readers yeah. to do as a result. So well, yeah, my students do that. Sometimes what I've said to my students is like, you know, I feel like my job is not really to teach you to write as much as it is to teach you to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Um and it's then to figure great. out. <laughs> and then figure out how to use what you've paid attention to 
you know, turn it into language somehow. Well, whatever, whatever way you you feel works. Well, you've done a lot. You've and you've done a lot in a relatively short period, I think. I'm, I'm glad to no, hear you. No, it doesn't feel that way to you. But. Not at all. I mean, I feel like I started late, and you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna write that much. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that you know, for the, for the fact that I've found it, or it seems to be working. Um, it's found you too, and your teachers. You know, you're teaching the next generation too. How do you find your students coming along? What challenges do you think they face? I think this publishing climate is so difficult these days. Um, yes. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that's that's happening to the post Harry Potter generation is that there isn't a like there isn't a sense of of literature as like any more special than a lot of other media. Right. Um, and I don't know that that's entirely bad, but I also feel like something is being lost and it's hard to put my finger on it exactly. But like, you know, a book is not like a TikTok video. Sure. Like there's, there should be some more, like there's, it, first of all, it takes a lot more effort to write a book than it does to make, you know, a TikTok video. And there's something about, um, I, I think I, there's something about the way that um, somebody's life um, pays, like, hmm, it, it, there's something about the way that uh, somebody's biography relates to their work that mm -hmm. I think is becoming a little bit too tight around yeah. fiction especially um it's the you know and i was sort of alluding to this earlier it's that um people are not really i think people are forgetting what fiction is and yeah. and there's a sure. sense that there's a sense that what writers do is just like live their life and then regurgitate it onto the page yeah and there's no, it's okay to be totally artless about that. And then, you know, expect to be patted on the head. And then you can mine your own trauma for work. I think that's an ex especially dangerous concept. I mean, it, I, I sort of see where it comes from. It's all about the kind of persona of like rock and roll and and R&B and hip hop is so much about the personalities and and the way that these personalities represent various things to to people um that you know people who are you know people who are making work in various ways kind of want to absorb that like rock star energy and turn it into their own work but i think when it comes to fiction it kind of doesn't work because a, most a lot of authors are very different from the people that they are writing about. And that is good <laughs> because if they just wrote about the people that they are, it really wouldn't be that interesting. Um, and there's something about storytelling that is not just, you know, repeating what happened to me. Yeah. Um, and there are some people who are actually quite good at repeating what happened to me. And, but they're not writing fiction, really. I mean, they're writing a f kind of fiction. You could argue that what they're doing is like, you know, creating a persona for themselves, you know, even as, the, you know, because writing about yourself, you you have to sort of create some version of yourself that isn't entirely derogatory, I think. And, you know, it's very, really difficult to write about um, a, a relationship, for example, that is ongoing without having, and then publish things without having that relationship be affected <laughs> probably negatively. Even if, even if like all you do is say like how great this person is, right? Like you can't, you know, even that is going to seem like a cover up. Never write about your children. It always comes back. <laughs> uh, well, 
I don't have any problem writing about my children. <laughs> well, I don't have any. <laughs> that's probably a, a good thing for a writer. Mm, um, I, you know, I'm not going to gloat. <laughs> kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. There's a lot of, you know, the human experience that I'm missing out on. But yeah, maybe I get a little more time to work. Well, where are you in the next book? I mean, it's been a while since you finished this one. What? <laughs> I, published, I published two books within a year. All right. All right. When somebody starts telling me I read both of them. Oh, no. <laughs> they're coming up to me and confessing like, oh, I haven't read it yet. Oh, I haven't read it. I'm just like, just buy it. I don't care. I have so many books. I have a huge pile of books on my desk by people I know a lot of the time that I have no. yet to read. Ugh. Um, so I have no right to like demand that anyone actually read anything I've written. I'm just well, like, just I, will, buy it. I um, will read everything you write. Oh, that's very kind of you. That's a bit aloud <laughs> because it's so much damn fun. That's all I can say. It's so nice of you. Thank you. For oh, well, we've been celebrating Pride Month with Jade Tanaham. We've been very lucky to have this time with you. Thank you so much for being so generous. You're so welcome. It's been fun talking to you. Thank you.